I want to be ready. I want to be ready. I want to be ready to walk in Jerusalem just like John. Oh, John, oh, John, now didn't you say? Walk in Jerusalem just like John That you'd be there on that great day Walk in Jerusalem just like John I want to be ready I want to be ready I want to be ready To walk in Jerusalem
members of the team were Augsburg College student and the team's outstanding second tenor, Dave Anderson, into, whom, into whose mind God had pla placed the idea for the team and who had recruited all of the team members and who had made all of the arrangements and who was already in New York City making final arrangements for the group's departure. There was also Northwestern Bible College student and the team's incredibly gifted pianist and second trumpet player, Wayne Baker, who was at his home in upstate New York getting ready to leave for New York. And, and finally, last but not least, and unfortunately he was going to be here today, but he couldn't be, there was Lutheran, Luther Seminary graduate, an articulate, boyish looking, 30-something Lutheran pastor from Esterville, Iowa, the very, very reverend Roy Hendrickson. And Roy was going to be here today. He'd gotten as far as from Scottsdale to uh, Albert Lee, where he had been a pastor for many years. And then he got sick, and he's in bed this morning. And uh, we, we miss him a lot. But we are videotaping this so that uh, Roy can see it also. Uh, the six members of the team had actually been traveling together already for six months every weekend in uh, Lutheran congregations throughout the, throughout the upper Midwest. We had been doing Saturday evening programs and Sunday morning programs and Sunday evening programs in order to raise money through uh, free will offerings for the trip and to, to work on our uh, ability to communicate with young people and to marshal some prayer support. In fact, just one week before we left, we'd been in this sanctuary uh, for Sunday morning programs and Sunday evening programs, and all eight of us had knelt right here uh, at these kneelers uh, for our commissioning service that night. Officiating that night in the commissioning service were Ebal J. Conrad, the gentle uh, shepherd of the flock here at Trinity, uh, Reverend Clifford Anderson, Dave's father, Reverend Martin Wickman, Dan's father, Reverend Arnold Stone, Dale's father, <laughs> Reverend Wilbur Westerdahl, the president of the Minnehaha Academy, from where both uh, Dan and Gary had graduated, and uh, a dynamic youth director from, from Trinity at that time, Don Flato. It must have been particularly exciting for Don to see this. In fact, Don was with us on the front steps uh, the day that we left and uh, offered a, a departure prayer when we left. It must have been particularly exciting for him to see this because this first international youth-to-youth -youth Lutheran outreach, evangelistic outreach, because it had been just two years earlier that Don's own pioneering vision of youth-to-youth -youth evangelism in the Lutheran Church had taken a huge leap forward when he had brought together 13 young people, mostly from Trinity, uh, all college age, uh, who uh, he dubbed the Gospel Crusaders and who traveled that summer through Wisconsin and Minnesota and North Dakota giving uh, programs and, and witnessing. It was a, I'm sure he was particularly excited that day as, as the team began to leave. He wasn't very involved in the creation of this team with Dave, but at times when Dave had no support from anybody and there were a lot of people who were saying it would never happen, uh, it was to Don that, that Dave went and received encouragement and said, go for it. Well, Black Agnes made it safely to New York, and we were on our way to Scandinavia. Within the first 72 hours of our time in, in Scandinavia, in Stockholm, we realized that we were in for a really unique summer, because during those first 72 hours, uh, we had sung for a huge crowd of people, 2,500 people, in Kungsträdgården. Kungsträdgården is the King's Garden, and it is uh, the equivalent in Stockholm to what Central Park is in New York. We have presented uh, full programs for two packed churches in Stockholm to 1,000 and 1,600 people. We have been received by the by Archbishop Gunnar Hultgren, who was the primate of the uh, Swedish Lutheran Church, in his home, adjacent to the huge 13th century Gothic cathedral in Uppsala, where just the night before we had sung for another large crowd of people who were gathered in a nearby park to celebrate the 800th anniversary of the Diocese of Uppsala. It had been uh, founded in 1164 as a Roman Catholic diocese. For the next 
12 weeks, we traveled throughout Norway, Sweden, and Finland, and into uh, Denmark, and also into France. And we shared our message of faith in Christ with thousands of young people and adults in large state churches and smaller chapels, in summer Bible conferences and, and youth meetings, in, uh, uh, on beaches, in tent meetings, uh, late at night in, in dance pavilions, even occasionally in some bars where we would sing and play our instruments and invite people to the next day's meeting. In Sweden alone, we had 101 programs in 44 days in 29 different locations, mostly the packed houses from the very south of Sweden to areas above the Arctic Circle. Uh, we played an uncountable number of volleyball games, winning most of them. And we were probably personally responsible for the introduction to Swedish young people of that craze that was sweeping American college campuses in the early 60s. The frisbee. In fact, Dan writes in his diary that my frisbee probably was the greatest tool that we had in breaking the ice with Swedish young people when we come to an area. You could always recognize us. We were the eight guys in identically matching black suits with a Bible in one hand, a frisbee in the other hand, and spinning the volleyball on our nose. <laughs> We were received extraordinarily warmly, particularly by the young people. And it gave us an opportunity again and again, as young people crowded around because they, were, they wanted to spend time with us, we had the opportunity to, to gently, but almost always, change the conversation to what it meant to know Jesus personally and to walk through life in concert with him. It was an amazing summer. This morning we're going to do you know, that I say, we're going to do music. I, I, I love to say it that way. We're going to do music. My teammates are going to do music. I'm going to come in from time to time just to ask them a few questions. But we're going to do music that was only, only the music that was done that summer in Scandinavia. So this morning, we invite you to sit back, imagine that this is 1964, and that you are sitting in a huge cathedral in Helsinki or Uppsala or a, a smaller chapel in Umeå, or Schleftio, or Unschensvik, or Piteå, or a dance pavilion in Lulio, or a summer Bible conference in Borgoda near Gothenburg, or a city park in Jönsjöbyn, or a huge uh, circus tent in Moulouse, France. And if you listen really carefully, you may just hear the voices of the Lutheran gospel team from America, singing the song with which they often open their services and programs, a prayer before singing.
extemporaneous answers to questions, but I, I would be interested to know, Dave, you have mentioned before that you felt a, a very specific um, reason for wanting to put together the team in Scandinavia, and you, you told me at one time a long time ago that uh, God spoke to you in a special way. How was that? I had been in 1962 on a missing Christ gospel team in South America. Everything that could go right about that team went right. Everything that could go wrong went wrong. We were down from there for four months in Peru, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Colombia. And uh, that was my first experience on a team like that. But I could see what a youth team could do in communicating the gospel. So I came back to Augsburg. And uh, 1960, fall of 62, 63, and one night I had a vision. Um, I can say I had dreams <laughs> last night, the night before, the night before probably, but I think only once in my life I've had a vision. And the vision was to me as clear as if somebody had drawn a map and handed me a document. The vision was to take a gospel team to Scandinavia. I woke up in the morning and I just knew that that was what I was supposed to do. Uh, the Scandinavians didn't know anything about it. Sort of the next few months it was cart before the horse. And I asked Gary and Dan and Dave Nelson and Dale and these guys if they would join with a team, be on a team. To, to go in the summer of 1964 on this team in Scandinavia. But before we did that, as Gary said, we were in a tremendous number of churches here in the Midwest before we went in order to take up offerings to buy the plane tickets and make that thing work. And the hero in the group, in my work, in my view, is Duane Branson. Because Duane Branson was a student at Concordia College of Morgan. The rest of us were all around the Twin Cities. Duane would get on the Great Northern train on Friday night after his classes were done, took a train all night long to be down here. Saturday and Sunday, especially Sunday morning and Sunday night, we were in churches presenting programs. Sunday night, sometimes 10, 11 o'clock at night, to put him back on the train, he went back to Moorhead and got into class the next morning and he did that for, do you have any idea how many weekends you did that? A lot. A lot. Did you graduate? <laughs> he did graduate, but he said his grades suffered that semester. <laughs> and uh, he just told me that a minute ago. But I mean, it was unbelievable that he did that so that we could be as a team going out and presenting programs. And, uh, and then um, I wrote a letter to the pastor of the American Congregation, English speaking Lutheran congregation in Stockholm. Rudolf Burke uh, became a dear friend. And I said, We've got a gospel team that wants to come to Scandinavia. So he went over to the folks in the evangelical free movement within the Church of Sweden. The, the same movement from which the old Augustan ascended and a lot of the people that are our ancestors came from and said this team wants to come over here. They sent a man over here, a pastor by the name of Tarson Josephson. When was that, Gary? It would have been uh, late in 1964. Early 64. And uh, we had a reception for him, and he was uh, had an article. There was a, the, Wilbur Tarkinson did an article about him and, and what was happening among young people in Sweden and so forth in the Minneapolis paper. He went back to Sweden and we got a telegram shortly afterwards that said, Welcome next summer, letter follows. <laughs> and then a letter came. And the letter said, We're welcoming your team. And then other invitations followed with Norway and with Finland. We did a lot, a lot of Finland, and quite a lot of Norway, but mostly Sweden. And, uh, and that's how it all started. And, uh, these guys were brave guys to, <laughs> we took a charter plane from New York uh, and, it, and it left two days late. We don't know if they were trying to take an offering for the fuel or, or what to do with, but it did finally leave a four-engine plane and uh, we landed at a military airport in London. We 
thought we were going to the main airport. What's it called? Heathrow. Heathrow, yeah. We landed at Stansted Airport, an old World War II airport outside of London. And we had to take taxis to the main airport in order to get on the SAS flight to Copenhagen and Stockholm. <laughs> And on the, there were two taxis. On the way, one of them ran out of gas. So we had to stop for gas. <laughs> and we got to, I was in the first taxi. We got to the airport just in the nick of time. And they were ready to close the door of the plane to go to Copenhagen and then on to Stockholm. And I said, we're not all here. We've got more coming. Four more people are coming. And I stood there with almost my foot in the door so they couldn't <laughs> close the door. And finally, how many was it? 12, 13 minutes or something like that. After the plane was supposed to leave, the plane left. And all the time you were lying to Oh, I was lying to them. I said, oh, I can see them now. They're coming right back. <laughs> Any of us had been in a car on the wrong side of the road. And these taxi drivers were going like you know what. And it was, oh, it was scary. <laughs> so now we're in Scandinavia. So what are the programs out like? Gentlemen? David singing. Well, you know, I was going to sing a song that I haven't sung for 50 years, but I'm not going to do that. It's a good song. Down from the story, it's a good song. But I'm going to sing a song I learned just a little bit after this experience. And it's been, I didn't write it, but it's been, it was written by a friend of mine, and it's been a, kind of a theme song for me. The first song I ever recorded about um, 30, 39 years ago. I've had many tears and songs, and I've had questions for tomorrow. There have been times I
best person in our troop, Dale Stone. Dale hasn't regularly played the trumpet, but he agreed that he would, and he did his lip, lip in shape. How's the lip, Dale? It's coming. It's coming. <laughs> well, I remember, I remember many of the times that Dale played, but I remember one time in particular. We were in the, the great cathedral in Helsinki. When you enter the harbor in Helsinki, the city is before you, and the, at the top is this huge, huge uh, cathedral. It has a marvelous organ. We almost didn't get Wayne to leave, as a matter of fact. <laughs> but I remember Dale playing in this huge cathedral and the trumpet sound would reverberate through the entire building. It was wonderful. Dale? i to describe how I ended up on the team. When I was a senior in high school, I applied to attend an international youth conference in Germany. And I was interviewed by J. Wurtz Bergstrand, who was the director of the youth division for the Augustana Luther League. And he said, Dale, you have the best application and recommendations of anybody. And I was one of 13 finalists. They sent nine. But he said, but I'm not going to send you to uh, Europe because the average age of the people that go to these conferences is a little older than you. But he said, I'm confident that in God's timing, you will arrive in Europe eventually. Mm -hmm. So I just trusted the Lord to do that. He gave me a, a, a position as a caravan, and we did four-day workshops. Uh, in strengthening the youth departments of, of local churches. We happen to work in the UP in, in Finland. But anyway, so fast forward. Now keep in mind, I had told nobody about my sense that I was supposed to end up in Europe. One day uh, at Augsburg, I was coming from chapel. They had got chapel that day. He was going the other way. <laughs> and he said, he said, Dale, how about this? Well, let's get a gospel team and go to Scandinavia. Uh, you can play horn, we'll have, we'll have quartet. And, and we'll get an excellent speaker and so on. Uh, <laughs> we didn't get the quartet. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Good one. so uh, anyway, the scripture verse that ties into this is Psalm, um, Psalm uh, 147 14. It says, I will fill you with the finest of the week. I could have got depressed that I didn't get to go to Europe, but Dr. Bertrand said, I trust that God will take care of it. So David said, what do you think? Let's go to Europe and have the gospel team and so on. So I prayed about it for 1.5 seconds. I said, yes. <laughs> David was the first person I ever told him I had had this vision and this yearning to go to Scandinavia. So that's how I ended up on the team. And I was just kidding about the speaker. <laughs>
I still don't. <laughs>
two, uh, two years uh, later, after our team, the summer of 64, Dave brought a Swedish choir from a little town called Bullied in Sweden. Um, and the choir was here and traveling for the entire, well, for half the summer. Uh, I had the, the privilege of traveling with them uh, as their uh, chaplain and evening speaker. Uh, there was a young uh, Norwegian baritone who traveled, his name was Lage Vedin, marvelous voice, and his wife, Lisbeth, and Wayne, and his wife, Barb, and a young gal, Donna Gadling, and I then spent the rest of the summer traveling together. I had a chance to hear that every night for the whole summer. Yeah. It was marvelous. Dave Nelson uh, came back, finished Bethel, has had a, a career, and one of the things that has been very impressive to me has been Dave's uh, realization that when you're involved in a, in a life's work, you can also be deeply involved in the Lord's work. And he's recently, over the last few years, been involved in a number of missions. Would you just mention a little bit about that? I didn't know I was going to, but, uh, you know, opportunities are available to all of us. So we just have to recognize them and trust God for them. And uh, Angie's cousin, actually, uh, was having lunch. He and his wife were having lunch with us one day and were telling us about a trip that he had taken seven consecutive years to Guatemala, working with a group called uh, Phelps International. And they were working uh, in the Mayan Indian villages. And I said, that sounds like something I'd like to do. He said, well, you can't, but the group is filled. Uh, so I just let it pass it off. And, and uh, he called about three weeks later and said, there's an opening. Were you serious about going to Guatemala? And I said, yeah, I think I am. And uh, that was uh, two trips ago. So we've had uh, two 10-day trips to Guatemala working with the Mayan Indians. Uh, Angie and I have, uh, in the past, owned a camper. And we drive it down to, uh, to New Orleans and work in Habitat for Humanity for two weeks. Her brother uh, talked us into going to Mexico to a little Indian uh, a little fishing village in Mexico and we spent two weeks uh, uh, building homes for uh, widows in uh, this little Indian village, uh, Chakala. Uh, and uh, in uh, about a month from uh, now, six weeks from now, I'm going to Brazil and uh, going to be teaching English as a second language to uh, Wycliffe uh, Bible translators who are non-English speakers. Uh, I really didn't think I should be doing that. I hardly speak English myself. <laughs> and I speak no Portuguese. Uh, but uh, the leader said, well, that doesn't matter. You're there to teach English. They have to talk to you. So, uh, so we're just trusting the Lord and stretching our finances and doing what opportunities come along. And uh, I guess uh, that would be my encouragement to you. Uh, this gospel team... 50 years ago was uh, one of the first opportunities that came along, and uh, it has shaped my life.
American rock and roll music evening in Sweden, and they put a restriction on us that we couldn't talk, but we sang, and I played my horn. And uh, afterwards, uh, we split up and we did personal evangelism. I led a lady to the Lord, a lady to the Lord. After she prayed to the Lord uh, for salvation, I said, what difference will this make in your life? She said, see the drummer up there playing right now? He and I are written together. I'm going to have to tell him adios. <laughs> so, uh, even though performance, uh, musical performance was uh, our ticket to get into the country, right, David? Uh, what, what we really wanted to do was just to share the love of the Lord with people. I want to share one other thing from you that are, are not all in in your relationships. When my wife was 27 and I was 30, she suddenly got a brain infection and she passed away in just uh, six days. So don't, when you look at your personal relationships, don't put off to be all in, okay?
six different uh, older folks' homes in Redwood, where it lives now, uh, in three or four days a week. One other octogenarian. When I left the LEM, I wondered who would be the best person in the world to take over the reins. There was no question in my mind. There was a fellow named Dick Plowater, and Dick is here this morning. Dick, would you stand? No. Nope. 
hill. All the way from, well, I don't know where it is now. Big world. Big world. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, thanks for the great community. Getting the lip up, you did well. <laughs> oh, man. Redeemer God 